Hello, welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Marites Vitug and joining us is Mare Hebert, a senior associate of the Southeast Asia Program of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Mare is a former journalist who has covered Southeast Asia extensively. He used to write for the Wall Street Journal, the Far Eastern Economic Review. Ages ago, I remember Mare's writing from the review. And he recently wrote a book, a big book, a 500-pager entitled Under Beijing Shadow, Southeast Asia's China Challenge. Yes, I'm go I was going to ask him to show it, and we can show it again at the end of the program. So it's I've gone through most of the chapters, and I found it uh, very informative. So thank you, Murray, for joining us. And maybe let's start this conversation with the most recent a uh, tour of China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi to some Southeast Asian countries. Uh, is this a, a routine thing that he does, goes to Southeast Asia so often? But uh, and what do you think this trip achieved? Well, um, yeah, I, I, it's always hard to measure what a trip achieves like a few <laughs> days after it ends. But, but really, I think he was coming for various reasons. Uh, he had some meetings, virtual meetings, but uh, with with uh, Southeast Asian foreign ministers, but he hadn't really toured. And so now he went to the five mainland Southeast Asian countries and uh, to five of the Southeast Asian mainland Southeast Asian countries plus Singapore. And, um, uh, you know, I think he had had several agendas. One is, um, you know, to show that China cared in the midst of, of the still continuing difficulties like in um, Malaysia with COVID. Um, it was also maybe to show that China, you know, was concerned that these and would be willing to help uh, in light of the economic downturn after the COVID or as they're still going through the COVID in many cases. And But I think maybe the biggest reason was that, that um, uh, the U.S. has really started putting a lot of pressure on China, uh, in particularly in the South China Sea, but even on economic issues, sanctioning uh, two dozen uh, Chinese companies that were involved in, in building artificial islands in the uh, South China Sea. And the pressure that uh, much criticism of the U.S. of, of uh, China's stance and it's ignoring the uh, uh, 2016 arbitral tribunal again that ruled largely against China and for the Philippines. So he probably was there to try and ensure that countries remembered China's around and try to sort of build up morale and boost their support for China uh, and hope that they would not side with the uh, United States. So I think also in, in the Philippines, although he invited Foreign Minister Loxin to Beijing, uh, I was wondering if this is also part of the you know, vaccine diplomacy. The Philippines, we have ongoing, well, we have an agreement to undergo trials with two Chinese companies. So this is all part of this, this charm offensive during the pandemic. Right, I, I think so. And, and uh, besides, uh, Foreign Minister Luxon, you also had Foreign Secretary Luxon, you also had Lahut Panjati. Oh boy, he's a special uh, uh, General Lahut, who's a special advisor to uh, to President Jokowi in the Indonesia. Had been there right around the same time uh, uh, the Philippine Foreign Minister was there. They also were talking about uh, vaccines. He promised the Lao the Laos. Uh, vaccines, but it's not clear how much he promised in the other countries. It wasn't really reported much. So going to your book, Murray, uh, you classify, because Southeast Asia can be quite diverse, you classify the Southeast Asian countries and how they relate to China. Uh, maybe you can talk about it a bit and which to you are the smartest countries in terms of uh, dealing with China, you know, balancing uh, relations between China and then the relations with the U.S. and, the, and its allies? Wow, I didn't oh, anyway, answer that a, very neatly in the book, but I can, <laughs> so you're making me think, think now. Um, well, I think maybe the country that balances the most rigorously 
uh, in Southeast Asia is of course, Indonesia. They're very even handed. They hold both of the superpowers at arm's length and really uh, try to balance very closely. So they're looking uh, to uh, China for help on infrastructure uh, and other mining projects, et cetera, and even some electrical projects, uh, electricity projects. And then they, to the US, they're looking for some military equipment. Uh, you, you, we've seen that just in, over this weekend, uh, General Prabo, now the defense minister who had been banned from the United States for many years for alleged human rights violations was allowed into Washington and they were talking about uh, arms purchases uh, from, Indone uh, from, from Indonesia, yes. Um, I think, so that's in the maritime region. I think, I think you know, when you look at the neighbors uh, that are right, right butted on to uh, the south side of China. I think Vietnam has done a pretty good job. Um, China really puts a lot of pressure on them. They might be communist uh, uh, com uh, uh, comrades, but they really, uh, really have a lot of differences. And China has put a lot of pressure on them. But they try to uh, segment the South China Sea, which they push back immensely, but and and that has prompted them to step up cooperation with the United States. But it, um, it, but it really on the South China Sea there, uh, excuse me, on other areas than the South China Sea, they are very much uh, trying to cooperate with China and not irritate the Chinese. So why do you think Indonesia is able to uh, stand up to both, I mean, to China and, you know, as you said, uh, rigorously hold these two powers at arm's length, or at least deal with them reasonably? Well, I mean, it helps that they're, they're farther from China and there's a big sea between them, right? Um, but, but Indonesia is also the biggest country in, in Southeast Asia with 260 million population. Uh, it is almost 50% of Southeast Asia's GDP. Um, but, but China has really been putting pressure on Indonesia and North Natuna and sent, regularly sending in fishermen. They did it earlier this year. They did it last year, sending in fishermen that are accompanied by Coast Guard vessels and uh, mar maritime militia vessels and really harassing uh, the uh, Indonesians in that area looking for uh, fish, um, seafood. Um, but they, yeah, it's, it's almost a religion in Indonesia. They have done this for so long of, you know, this very even-handed balancing between superpowers. They have that down to an art, I think. <laughs> so I think uh, our president Duterte can learn from Indonesia and now going to the Philippines. Uh, what is your, yeah, you've written about the Philippines, but what is your assessment going forward? The last, how do you see, um, relations with China unfolding in the last two years of the Duterte presidency? Because it has been quite schizophrenic. As you know, Duterte sp spoke virtually in the UN General Assembly and upholding the 2016 arbitral ruling, a first, a first in his terms. So how do you see us moving forward? I mean, from a distance. Yeah, well, I would think that China pretty much is betting um, you know, that Duterte, they are seeing that Duterte is heading toward becoming a lame duck president. Um, one thing that shocked me, you know, Duterte in 2016, a few months after the ruling, uh, um, he goes to China and he renounces relations with the U.S. He's going to divorce from the U.S. and be China's friend forever. Um, and then they signed $24 billion in economic uh, aid, uh, not aid, sorry, investments. Well, it's ironic how little of that, virtually nothing, has been implemented. And I don't understand why Duterte in the Philippines and China don't move heaven and earth to get some projects going to prove to the Filipino population that being a friend of China uh, has some, some merit and gives some benefit. Instead, China keeps harassing uh, fishermen, it makes it very difficult uh, in Scarborough Shoal, for example. Uh, it's going to be interesting what China does because the Philippines has announced uh, it wants to start uh, 
exploring and exploiting oil and gas in three different blocks, including at Reed Bank, where China has shut them to shut down the Philippine operations in 2012, 2011, 2012. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how China reacts to that. I, I have to wonder if President Duterte or the foreign minister didn't tell the, Philippine, the Chinese in advance that they were going to do this because otherwise they're just leaving themselves open to having more vessels sailing in and, and threatening um, Filipino uh, exploration efforts. Um, so I, I, but I really, in the end, don't think China, whatever uh, it's going to do positively with the Philippines is going to soon peter out because we, the, you know, analysts always point out that Ch Philippines seems to go through uh, the cycle, a pro-American president, a pro-Chinese pro, so that, that would mean that in 2022, they should get a pro-American. <laughs> so China doesn't want to go too far with him, with the country. <laughs> yeah, in your book, and I think other studies have shown also that the, the delay in investments that of, from China in infrastructure all, also has to do with Philippine bureaucracy. Have, have you, uh, do you agree with that um, perception? Yeah, yeah I mean, um, it's interesting. Uh, people, uh, that's what analysts told me in, in Manila uh, when I was doing research on the book. Uh, that, um, that, you know, the, and, and some even set, went on to say, you know, uh, and the Philippines bureaucracy, it's equal, it takes equal advantage of everybody. It makes it tough for everybody to invest. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's maybe part of it. But I think many of those companies uh, were not really quite up to the task they signed a big agreement, but once they came here, they did not have the money to invest. And I think some of them found the, like there were some mining projects, which actually the president shut down a lot of the mining uh, after he took over. And so the mining thing is projects are on hold. Um, they, the, but in, you know, in the other countries in the region, the Belt and Road projects have, have problems almost everywhere. Indonesia, when they built that high, were starting to work on the high-speed rail between Jakarta and Bandung, they, they couldn't get land. You know, democratic countries uh, help, let farmers protest and hold on to their land. And so, so China gets a big headache. They're not used to this at home, uh, you know, not being told they can't get land. And then they even experienced, like with tiny Laos, when they were negotiating the railroad, the Lao negotiator for five years, they dickered over the interest rate. They dickered over how much land China would get on both sides of the railroad. So China, it does not, you know, it offers the money, but it's not very cheap. It's, they usually start negotiating at a, over 4% interest, while the Japanese come in with 0 0.75 or something like that. Um, and so it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a tough road to, to hoe for, for uh for, for China in getting involved in infrastructure. It's not that easy. And many of their predecessors of other countries have found that before them. <laughs> yes, and also the uh, many, a large, well not a large, but many Chinese companies in construction were also banned here in the Philippines. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so um, just say, I mean, just following up on your earlier statement. So, uh, Duterte is just coasting along, uh, realizing that he must not have, he must not put his eggs just in the Chinese basket. Right. I, I think that he's probably realized that by now. And that's maybe why he said some of the things at the UN, although he tried to walk that back. Yes. He and his <laughs> staff tried to walk it back the next day. <laughs> it wasn't very long. Um, <laughs> You know, but there are other things happening with the U.S. The military is still cooperating a lot with the U.S. Um, and doing some exercises uh, that are working quite well. So I think, you know, the Philippines, it sounded like Duterte was pivoting abruptly to China, but it's been, a, I think they, in many ways, the Philippines, except for Duterte's rhetoric, has been quite even-handed. Yes. So, um... You were saying that as a whole, uh, Southeast Asia doesn't want to choose between China and the U.S. But is China forcing this issue in South, 
I mean, based on your research, is it forcing this issue in Southeast Asia? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, they certainly are pressing countries to be friendly. And you have countries like Cambodia that, that really have, we'd say, bandwagoned with China pretty thoroughly under Hong San. Um, and then when, when ASEAN tries to get a, a, united, a unified policy on like the South China Sea, the China, China can often convince uh, Cambodia to, to block the unanimity. And so it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, I think they want countries to be very friendly. They want countries that they want to profit from, from economic uh, cooperation. Uh, they, part of the reason for the Belt and Road is they have a lot of workers and they have a lot of cement and they have a lot of steel and they can't use it at home so much. Um, and they have a lot of consumer goods. Uh, and they rely on countries in Southeast Asia to provide things for the uh, components for the global supply chain. So they really need Southeast Asia. Um, I think they certainly want Southeast Asia to be deferential in the South China Sea. I don't know how far they're going to go on this. I think the pressure that we saw on Vietnam uh, last year and uh, Vietnam and Malaysia last year, the middle of the middle half dozen months in the middle of the year uh, and uh, also earlier this year of harassing uh, oil and gas exploration activities uh, suggests that they may, and, and the way they harass fishermen, including Filipinos and, and, and Vietnamese and others, is they're trying to, I think, say that the resources in the nine dash line are ours. Minimally, they don't want countries to do uh, joint exploration, uh, exploitation of hydrocarbons uh, with a Western company, a foreign company, outside company. If they want to do it, they can do it with Chinese companies like Sinoc or one of the others. But, but I, I think that's becoming pretty clear. And that's why I was wondering when I commented what's going to happen with the, uh, the three blocks that uh, the Philippine Ministry, Minister of Energy was talking about a few days ago. Uh, I, in the final draft, or I think we saw the final draft, the Philippines says that there should be a service contract, or an arrangement of a service contract with a Chinese company, which means that this Chinese company will pay taxes to the Philippines, will mm -hmm. recognize the sovereign rights of the Philippines. So do you think China will agree to this? Because that was the last time we ever heard about it. I mean, that was the yeah. condition given by the Philippines. Yeah, and, and plus it's the constitution of the Philippines exactly. makes it illegal to give a company uh, sort of major control of a natural resource project. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what China will do. I, I'm dubious. <laughs> uh, they, you know, there was that earlier project back during uh, President Gloria's period of, of when they had a Vietnam, China and Philippines pro joint project. And it just died on the vine eventually. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, that China would agree to to pr promise that that a, a, a deal like a service contract would necessarily uh, mean that they would no longer push sovereignty issues. Maybe, uh, Mary, can you talk a bit about what's the upcoming elections in the U.S. and what, how will foreign policy, not about the election itself, but how would policy towards China be under a Biden presidency, or policy towards Southeast Asia, will there, how will it be different if he wins? <laughs> yeah, if he wins. <laughs> I, you know, he's obviously leading in the polls, but uh, Hillary Clinton was leading in the polls last time too. And, and she actually won the popular vote, right? But she lost in the electoral college. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, people ask that a lot. I ask, ask that a lot myself. Um, I, uh, under under uh, uh, Trump, if he would re win again, it would obviously, the, con the pressure on China would likely continue. The economic pressure, the pressure on the South China Sea, uh, the sanctions, uh, the tariffs, that would likely continue. But one thing I have to say is the mood in the United States about China has really 
moved in a bilateral fashion against China. Even Democrats are saying very um, critical things of China. I think uh, pres if there is a President Biden, he would uh, continue pressing China on things that irritate the United States, like intellectual property rights, forced uh, a tech technology transfer, the use of state-owned enterprises to compete and subsidies for companies that make their trade so much more competitive and cheaper. I think he would st stick with that. Does he stay with with uh, the tariffs or does he use a different way? I, I don't know. But he one thing I think he would do is, is try to work with uh, friendly countries rather than being America first and only, only, only country that does everything. He would, he's used to, you know, the alliances, the NATO, the working closely with APEC and, and working in the WTO and the ICC and all these, these inst international institutions. He, uh, well, that's one thing I think he would do. And the other is he may look for ways to cooperate with China for example, climate change is a huge deal that affects both China and the United States. They're the two largest uh, emitters uh, and uh, of greenhouse gases. And I think I, I, I can, if, if China is open to it, I think Biden would try to separate out things. We can't, we're, we're really at odds here and we're not gonna negotiate away unless you wanna compromise, but we are gonna negotiate over here. And I, I think that will be a different tone he will not do tweets at 3.22 in the morning that will make <laughs> policy for the world, <laughs> US policy to the world. He, um, and he will just uh, you know, not be quite as what we might say, sharp elbowed as the Trump administration. How about in Southeast Asia? How, how do you see a Trump uh, administration? Uh, I, I think we we're under the radar here. Yeah, right? a little bit. <laughs> so in, 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 right now in the campaign, yes. Um, you know, they're, they, in fact, foreign policy has a very low priority right now. I mean, it's you know, how are we going to deal with COVID? How are we going to deal with the economic crisis, race relations, uh, just so many differences, um, battles over the Supreme Court and all of these things. So I think foreign policy is quite low on the priority list. But of course, that's going to be one of the first issues that uh, that the new president, especially if it's Biden, will have to face. I think, you know, he was around during the uh, during Obama's President Obama's rebalance to Asia, the pivot to Asia. I th uh, that included a lot of focus on Southeast Asia. So I know that he has hosted Southeast Asian leaders in Washington. He's as also was the Senate Foreign Relations Committee chair or minority leader forever, for many years. So he's very familiar. And uh, so I think he'll, it'll, it'll, he'll, um, he'll um, you know, put emphasis on Southeast Asia and realize that this is sort of the front line, you're the front line states or ground zero for competition. Um, and so I, I expect he would continue providing uh, military equipment for like uh, the maritime domain awareness and to help people, uh, countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, figure out exactly what China is up to. Um, so I, I, I don't think that uh, Southeast Asia will fly under the radar forever, <laughs> but maybe the, the first year well, when, he, when the new administration is trying to get a grip on the economy, on COVID, um, which is, is very bad in the U.S. when we know you guys in the Philippines know about that too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on that final, one final question, I, I just remember that in your concluding part of the book, you talked about Southeast Asian countries, the need for Southeast Asian countries to talk more with each other and like, compare experiences so that they don't get into the same experiences with China. And yeah. you think ASEAN is not cohesive enough in that sense then? No, no, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, I had a few examples, but in the book, but you know, for example, um, Laos 
is building a railroad, Thailand is still dragging its feet, but they're both offered 2% interest rate while Malaysia is paying 4%. Najib, the now ousted prime minister on trial for corruption, he agreed to pay 4% because China was over, over uh, paying, giving him, uh, they're charging too much for the project and then he got money for paying one MDB debt and, and uh, running his election campaign. But the thing that Laos doesn't know is that, didn't know when they started their railroad, is that Thailand has no plans to build a railroad soon. So we're going to have a railroad from Kunming to Vientiane. That's not a very densely traveled route, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and what are they going to do? Send water buffalo for a vacation in China on these things? Um, or mangoes and sticky rice? I mean, you know, it's... Um, now, if China's going to wait 10 years, by the, that time, Laos has lost a lot of money on this railroad if, if Thailand has no hurry. And the Thais told me, Ban around Bangkok, we could use high-speed trains, but we don't need it from Nankai to Bangkok. The, all the major commercial and business and the manufacturing activities are on Bangkok. Um, so those are, those are and, and if, you know, I just thought too that if, um, if the countries would compare pair notes on what's happening in the South China Sea more. Um, you know, when Malaysia and Vietnam were getting a lot of pressure last year and, and, and earlier this year, they didn't really talk. I, um, the Malaysians just, uh, I think the Vietnamese would be open to it, but the Malaysians tell me there's not much interest in, in Kuala Lumpur about this. Uh, but you need to do that. And the other place where it's really critical, which doesn't affect the Philippines, of course, is the um, Mekong. The Mekong is facing serious drought because China's holding back a lot of water in the upper reaches. They have 11 dams they've built in the upper reaches of the Mekong. And um, if I think ASEAN countries need to cooperate on this. And if they could horse trade, but you know, I'll support you on the South China Sea, you support me on the Mekong. And I think they could put a lot of pressure on China to, to uh, let them know how much water they're holding back. In, because the, uh, the Mekong, the lower Mekong, supports the livelihoods for 60 million people. It is very important for keeping the southern uh, Mekong Delta and Vietnam above sea level. And it's also important for the survival of the Tonle Sap, one of the richest uh, uh, fish uh, uh, migrating and breeding areas in, in Asia. And uh, uh, they're not able to travel up these, up into Tonle Sap and, and uh, Spahn. And so it's um, major damage being done. And, uh, you know, you could have millions of refugees be created from, you know, China talks about all the aid they're giving to Laos. Well, yeah, but they're destroying their lower Mekong, uh, the, the agricultural activity along the Mekong. That also costs a lot of money. And so I think uh, standing together, ASEAN could uh, put more pressure on China. China wouldn't like a block of 10 standing up against it. Um, they don't have to, st I'm not saying stand up on everything, just, you know, there's a couple of critical issues. Yes, that's a, we hope then that your book will be read by our decision makers here in Southeast Asia. Can you show us again, Murray, the book? Yep. And where can our viewers order it from Amazon? Amazon is the easiest. And that, yeah, Amazon. because we don't have it here yet in the Philippines. Mm. But anyway, thank yeah. you very much for, for this Thanks, interview. Mary. And let's yeah. stay in touch. And also to our viewers and, and listeners, we will continue discussing about Southeast Asia and how we relate to China. So goodbye. Great. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Bye. It was fun. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.